Koto, it's wonderful to be here with you for this third week of Advent. Um, and welcome to, to everybody who is watching online or listening uh, as well. It's great that you can join us too. So we're now in December, the month of the Christmas tree decoration. Who's got their tree up? Oh, that's quite a good show. We had to do ours last weekend because we knew that uh, this weekend was going to be a particularly hectic one because December, as many of you know, is also the month of dance rehearsals and dance shows. So uh, that, ruled out, th that ruled out this weekend for us. But I'm very happy to say last weekend went relatively smoothly and the only glass ornament that smashed was dropped by an adult, wasn't me, um, not a child. <laughs> but not all of our Christmas tree decoration uh, times have gone like that. I do remember fondly the first time Matt and I decorated a Christmas tree when we were dating, his parents' tree, and he literally sat like this, watching the placement of every decoration that went onto the tree. He thinks I exaggerate, but I don't. This memory is so crystal clear in my head. Um, but the plus side of having this incredible attention to detail is that our kids are learning the value of a well-balanced tree. And um, now we have the space of beauty in amidst the chaos of the year end. So, you know, that's wonderful. I love you. It's great. Um, but this year, when we're talking about peace, it does feel like a particularly strange concept. The hecticness of our calendars and schedules aside, if we're honest, I think a lot of us have an underlying sense that not all is right with our world. And there's also a sense that we need to acknowledge that. 2023 kicked off looking so promising, COVID was largely behind us, and now we've still got people dealing with the flooding that happened in month one of the year. We've got wars and violence, we've got huge unrest, the mortgage rates, I don't need to tell you any of this, are through the roof, cost of living skyrocketed, and these are major and very real things that are threatening the lives, the well-being and the stability of so many people worldwide. We can feel the current of turmoil and unrest in our bones and in our stomachs. And I think that chaos in our internal world and what we're seeing in the external world can, make seem, um, can seem sometimes just too big too complex and too much to even begin to hope for peace. How do we hope for that? And even though we can hear the need and the world crying out for peace, it feels elusive, improbable, and kind of impossible. And I know from some of my conversations with you, there is a real deep heart's cry of what do we do? What can I do in the middle of everything that our world is facing? And where is God? And the reality is that our world right now is actually not super different from the world of Mary. Because when she became pregnant, the Jewish people uh, were theoretically living in peace, Pax Romana. Rome had taken great pride in the peace and stability that it had brought to all its uh, conquered worlds. But it was a fake peace. It was an illusion of peace because it was peace that they had brought by military force. Um, and it was built on oppression and injustice. And so in reality, Mary's people were at the bottom of the pecking order in their world. They were living under layers of control. Firstly, they had Rome, which had all of the unopposable imperial and military authority over Judah. Then they had Herod, who had the civil authority over them. And then finally, they had the Jewish religious leaders who had all the spiritual and domestic authority over every aspect of their lives, including controlling who could even have access to God in the temple. Not a great situation. So when Mary sings, she's declaring anew God's vision for the world in the face of her current reality. And she's bringing a completely revolutionary message into a world where her people are dominated by the wealthy, the powerful, and the social elite. And this song flips it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor 
and theologian preached on this and he had some great stuff to say. He said, the Song of Mary is the oldest Advent hymn. It is also the most passionate, the wildest, and the most revolutionary Advent hymn that has ever been sung. This is not the Mary, the gentle Mary portrayed in paintings. There is none of the sweet, wistful, or even playful tone of many of our Christmas carols, but instead, a hard, strong, relentless hymn about the toppling of the thrones in the humiliation of the lords of this world, about the power of God and the powerlessness of humankind. This is the sound of the prophetic woman of the Old Testament, Deborah, Judith, Miriam, coming to life in the mouth of Mary. Mary, who was seized by the power of the Holy Spirit, speaks by the power of the Spirit about God's coming into the world. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, sings Mary joyfully. But what does that mean to call her blessed? Mary, the lowly maidservant. It can only mean that we worship in amazement the miracle that has been performed in her, that we see in her how God regards and raises up the lowly, that in coming into this world, God seeks not the heights, but rather the depths, and that we see the glory and power of God by seeing made great what was small. We see the glory and power of God by seeing made great what was small. And so we start to get a glimpse of the change, of this reversal of power that Jesus would bring. Mary knew the significance of this child that she was carrying. And God's goal for all humankind is peace and it would come through Jesus. Because this baby, who was God himself, would bring peace to the world, connecting humankind back to God's self. From the very second Mary conceived, God had skin in the game. He was committed to making peace with us and freeing us from all oppression and justice. This was plan A with no plan B. Um, but peace, however, is a very tricky concept to articulate because in our Western framework, peace seems like a feeling we're chasing, you know, peace and quiet, often in solitude or a day at the spa. It's as if the idea of peace involves us being calmed down to some blissful psychological state. But when we look at peace from a biblical perspective, it dramatically enlarges and expands this idea. Because the word for peace in Hebrew is shalom. And shalom is a state of soundness or flourishing in all dimensions of existence, in our relationship with God, with one another, with nature and with ourselves. This is God's basic intention for humanity <coughs> that we live in a state of all rightness in every area of our lives. So that's a lot more than just an absence of conflict, a massage, you know, or some lovely time to yourself. Shalom thus combines in one concept the meaning of justice and peace because to know shalom requires the achievement of both justice and peace. They're inseparable ingredients of the same reality because it's through our at oneness with God and our commitment to God and His ways and God's commitment to us that we know shalom. Shalom cannot exist outside of God. It cannot be found in the world. It begins and it ends with Him. 
So Jesus coming into the world was a disruption to the peace imposed by Rome. And he was replacing this Pax Romana with true peace that can only be found in relationship with God who created us for himself. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he promised his disciples the Holy Spirit to be with them when he wasn't, teaching them and reminding them of everything he told them and empowering them in the world. He said to the disciples, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. It's kinda as if Jesus knew the opposition and the persecution his disciples would face. Just like he knows every challenge, every trouble, every difficulty that we face. And he knew that the peace that the Holy Spirit offered was enough. And so Mary, as she sung her song, prophesying the peace Jesus would bring, as he reversed the natural order of the world, challenged the current values, lifted the lowly, scattered the proud. He showed mercy for those who feared him and filled the hungry with good things. This was bringing shalom. Mary spoke this by the power of the Holy Spirit in her, just like the Holy Spirit is with us today. Unfortunately, the church in every generation has faced the reality of injustice in the world, death, violence, suffering, and many times, sadly, it's contributed to the suffering of the world as well. So long as there is sin in the world, there will be people who will seek power and might and totally disregard the dignity and the lives of others to get it. Devastating human right tragedies and violations have been present throughout the ages. It's not right, but it's real. So then the question becomes, how the heck do we know peace in the face of this? We can have peace through the Holy Spirit, through God with us, who loves us and desperately desires all of humanity to turn to him for our healing, our renewal, and to be one with him. So what do we do for our beautiful but broken world? I think uh, we're all pretty over hashtag thoughts and prayers. It's not enough, right? There's a, an entire Wikipedia page about that, just to let you know, in case you wanna go down that rabbit hole. Um, but you know, what does feel enough when there will always be injustice, inequality, and so much need? We can feel like it's often, the approaches can be all prayers, are all actions, and as Christians, where do we sit within that? A phrase that I've heard this year is to be contemplatives in action. And I really like this. This is talking about being people who notice and to look for not just what's happening around us, but listen to what God might be prompting us to do. Jesus habitually spent time with God before going out to the people around him. So when we take, firstly, that time to pray, it takes the onus off us, and it reminds us who will one day judge the world and whose concern it ultimately is. It refuels us and gives us space for God to speak to us, to inspire us and guide us. And then from that space, we go and we act. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, to quote him again, called the church a people of the morning who live in the light of the dawn of grace in Christ. And he spoke about the world being in twilight. It's still dark, not all is well, yet the dawn of Christ is a sign. The kingdom is soon arriving, a new day dawning, that's significant. And the church is to live from the newly possible, waiting in certain hope for the world of resurrection. We have this tension between being agents of shalom in the world while we're also awaiting shalom. 
In Revelation 21, we have the beautiful picture of God coming to live amongst his people where he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And this is what we are ultimately waiting for. And as people of the morning, with God's Holy Spirit working through us, we look to bring peace to the world around us, knowing that not all wrongs will be put right in this life. Where do we begin? So I've been reading um, Tish Harrison Warren's book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, and she has this great chapter entitled, Fighting with My Husband, Passing the Peace in the Everyday Work of Shalom. And she talks in this about her personal experience of being drawn to work serving the least of these with a longing for and a vision of God's shalom. And says, although I profess big ideas about the beauty of shalom and God's ministry of peace crashing into our world, I often find myself squabbling and quarreling through the day with those I love the most. I'm a pacifist who yells at my husband. We cannot see God's peace and mission in the world without beginning right where we are, in our homes, neighborhoods, churches, with the real people right around us, because peace begins on the smallest of scales. In Aotearoa, many of you know, all the sto- you will know the story of Tarore. Tarore was the daughter of a Māori chief, Ngākuku, who was also a Christian. And when she was young, she'd been given a copy of her uh, father's Gospel of Luke. And when she was 10, she was taught how to read it in te reo Māori. And then one day, when she was 12, she was evacuated with her family from their hometown because a violent war had broken out. One night, while they were on the move, the, well, actually, yeah, the group was attacked and Ngākuku, her father, escaped, but Tarore was tragically killed by another warrior, Te Wita, who stole the necklace from around her neck. And he took that and he actually sought help from another Māori who could read it to explain what was written in the book, this taonga, this treasure that he had taken. And when Tuita was given the explanation of what was in the Gospel of Luke, this led him to being converted to Christianity. And so he returned to Tuita's father, Nakuku, uh, because in Māori custom, they would take revenge for the death of another. But instead, Nakuku preached forgiveness and how there was too much bloodshed, and he called his tribe to trust in God's justice. This act from Ngākuku was really significant in paving the way for reconciliation between the tribes. And the story of this and the words from the Gospel of Luke spread firstly around the North Island and then through the South Island to the Māori people where it was said the message spread like seed on the wind. And it had a massive impact on the Māori people coming to know Christ in Aotearoa. And all of this happened through Tarore, her little book of Luke and an act of forgiveness by her father. So what do we do? Well, in, one, in the words of one of the most famous queens of the past decade, do the next right thing. That's Queen Elsa of Arendelle, to those of you unfamiliar with the Disney Frozen franchise. Um, It's super annoying how right that is, though. Do the next right thing, however inadequate or imperfect it seems. For Mary, she embraced the role that God had given her in bringing Jesus into the world. She just said yes and got on with doing what was in front of her, being obedient to what God had asked her to do. And for those of you who've participated and share the love, that's an act of peace and hope and love. And you can bet for those kids and any parents watching them open presents, it's gonna be an act of joy as well. We cannot underestimate the power of little decisions and actions. God has made you, you, and can bring you, uh, use you to bring shalom wherever you are in your life. 
Afi Mai Te Aratu is a community gardening project local to us that connects in with local food banks. I love gardening and I find it really therapeutic for a myriad of reasons. And I'm hoping that next year that's something I can get involved in and involve the kids in too. Shalom with the land and bringing shalom to those who need the kai that the land produces as well. What opportunities might you have in your communities to bring shalom? Coming into close, as we advent, as we wait, as people of the morning, for Christ's coming both at Christmas and his second coming that brings the completion of his kingdom, we're invited to receive the peace that Mary sung about. And we're also invited to be agents of peace to those around us, beginning with those closest to us. In difficult times and we when we're feeling overwhelmed, prayer is still the best place to go. It lets us participate without losing hope. There was deep faith in Mary's prayer and a God who will one day right all wrongs. How do you need to pray today? As Newt said at the end of the service, we'll have prayer ministry and I want to invite you, if you need to, to come forward um, you may not even want to have anybody pray with you. Pretend this is an altar. Come and pray. Kneel, stand, do whatever you need to do. Give God any feelings of overwhelm, burdens. Pray, take a moment to talk to him and ask for his spirit to work in these places and bring peace. Or if you would like prayer, we would love to stand and pray for you and pray for the power of God's spirit to work where you need it in your life or the lives of those that you love to bring peace. And to close, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and pray together the peace prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. And as we pray this prayer, we stand with the many generations of the church who've turned to God with these very words to ask for God's help and to encourage each other to be people of peace in the world. So if you'd like to stand... Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, the truth. Where there is doubt, the faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. <clears throat>